Have you ever shouted for mercy? Maybe you're like me and you were wrestling with your older brothers and they took it a little too far, right? And I had to shout mercy, right? I needed just a little bit of mercy in the moments. Have, have you ever had to shout for mercy? Because listen, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to a relationship with God, I think that relationship with God, it really begins and ends with mercy because God is merciful to us. But the Bible, listen, it has a lot to say about mercy and, and really also very important. It has a lot to say about those who are unmerciful. And if you're like me, I read that word this week and I thought, that's not a word. Unmerciful. That doesn't sound like a word. That's like, that's like fishes. That's not a word. And it actually is a word, you know. Uh, unmerciful is also important. I think this is one of the most important beatitudes we could really try to grasp as we walk through these. Because when it comes to those who are unmerciful, the Bible describes these people as cruel, uncompassionate, wicked, evil, tortured, and unforgiving. And I know some of us, we just made it through Thanksgiving. You said, yeah, that sounds familiar. That sounds like someone I know. But one of the most important things we can do is to choose to, to grow and focus. And, and today, we're going to focus on this whole idea of mercy. Uh, because I think a lot of us, we really struggle to give mercy to others. And so here's another example. Uh, later in Matthew 18, Jesus gives us a parable of what this looks like practically, but also the dangers of what will happen if we are unmerciful. Okay? Uh, read with me this parable from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. You should see this behind me as well. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, just so you know, Peter was like, listen, God, I'm so holy. Listen, Jesus, I'm so holy. I'm not just going to forgive once or twice or three times. I'm going seven. That's how holy I am, Jesus. Should it be seven times that I do this? And what do you know that Jesus, you know, one-ups it, right? Because the very next verse, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Times. Other translations really kind of uh, write that differently. But, but Jesus is not talking about literally, not in a literal sense, of 77 times that, that, that my good friend Jim and I, and I've forgiven him 76 times. He's on thin ice. It's not about keeping track like that, right? It is, it is just the whole idea of being merciful. Have a heart of mercy. Let's pick this parable up now in verse 23. So, so Peter set it up. And Jesus then responds, and then Jesus gives us parable. And remember, a parable is a, 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 a heavenly teaching. Jesus is trying to, to instill, uh, impart a little bit of heaven into us with this parable. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Before I, I move into that next verse, just so you know, this is an impossible amount to pay back for, for this time. Think today, okay, millions of dollars just for today, okay? This is, this, you can't pay this back. So that's why it's highlighted. Verse 25, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all he had and the payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And you should not have, and you should 
not you have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, verse 35 is so key. So also, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This parable's intense, right? Merry Christmas. Welcome to church, okay? So listen, this is an unpayable debt. His whole family was to be sold. He begs this king for another chance, which is ridiculous because it's an unpayable amount. But the king showed him pity. No payment plan, no interest to be accrued or anything like that. He just shows mercy. And newly forgiven, what does this man do? Does he go out and forgive others who wronged him? Or feeling so blessed, does he extend mercy to others? Does he tip extra at the, at the restaurant later after church? No. Mercy for this other guy is non-existent. So this forgiven man is then, uh, sorry, so this man who has been forgiven throws this other servant into prison. And Jesus then really talks about the importance of this in verse 35. He says, my heavenly father will do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And so sitting here today, we may read that and think, like, yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. That is wild. That's crazy. Who would actually do something like that? But I think if we're being really honest, I think sometimes we can be scourges with our mercy. I think we can hold back on giving mercy to others, okay? I I think it just simply happens to us all. Jesus is telling a parable that is relatable, while an extreme example that is one, I think, that is still relatable to us all. And so I I just want to ask, really, until your debt is forgiven, can you truly understand how great mercy is? I, I think this man had all the opportunity to see what mercy was in his life and in his heart, and yet he chose to be unmerciful to others. Or to put it plainly, I think, until you recognize how sinful you are, you won't recognize how good God is. It's like sometimes when you're talking about God, you're talking about faith with other people who may not be believers, right? And you talk about how good God's been to you because of this, that, and the other, and they just look at you like you're speaking a different language. It's because they don't really recognize the situation that this great debt has been paid for them okay and so in the lord's prayer just a chapter later in matthew 6 jesus he says forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and so church listen yes you may have experienced god's mercy for yourself and you may say i'm a christian i follow christ but that should cause something to take place within you that compels you to be merciful toward others. And so if you hear nothing else today, if you're going to tune me out, then you're going to already be thinking of the football game later or something like that. Just just hear this, okay, and then you can tune me out, okay? Just hear this. Mercy should change how you view the world and live in community. I guess another way of saying it is that I don't think mercy is just a one-time occurrence that happens. I think mercy is a posture of the heart. I think mercy is something that you have. And that you are just ready to be merciful to others. I think, yes, it occurs in in, in small situations. But I think mercy goes beyond that. I think mercy is a way to understand someone's heart. So so let me ask, have you ever been forgiven of something? You know, you said or did something so ridiculous, but the person that you hurt forgave you? There is something so powerful about those three words— I forgive you. And I think it's because those words are a declaration. That as I forgive you, I choose not to hold onto that anymore. I choose to not see you through the lens of that wrong anymore. And I choose to never bring it up again. Because that's the weird thing about mercy. That's the strange thing about grace, is that it has a terrible memory. So if you say, I forgive you, you shouldn't mean that. It's not a matter of just saying, oh, it's okay. Don't we do that because we want to move on from the awkward, you know, like, oh, it's a weird conversation. You're apologizing for something. I'm okay. You're okay. It's okay. But it's not okay. I think we need to say those words. I forgive you.
because it releases the person. And also, you shouldn't say it unless you're ready to say it, right? That's, that's important. And so when, when, when we say, I forgive you, I think that's what it should mean. And so I believe this because this is how God sees us. This is how God sees you. When it comes to God, he sees us through mercy, his mercy to us. And so if you're still uncertain, look how important this is. Because there is one verse from the prophets that Jesus actually, he quotes twice in the book of Matthew. Okay? It's Hosea 6.6. 6. Uh, the Bible says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so before you come to bring your sacrifice, I need to remind you what God is really after. And that's a change in your heart. He wants to see us show mercy the way God has showed mercy to us. And so in the context of Hosea, what I just read, uh, the Israelites, who are God's people, uh, over time, they began to worship other gods while continuing their rituals. They continued to sacrifice. And it was almost as if they were saying, hey, God, look at us. We're obeying the law. Those Ten Commandments, we got them down. Look at us. We're, we're there. We're obeying the law. We're sacrificing. Yet they had no love toward God. And God is saying, I want mercy. Not these empty sacrifices. I want your heart, not just rituals that you're doing. God desired their love over external practices of piety and holiness and acting like they got their life all together. God longed for his people to long for him rather than just the religious tradition that they were stuck in. It was like a loveless marriage. God the groom was all in, but Israel the bride wasn't and wanted out completely. And so you could translate Hosea as saying that what God really wants is, is love. Does God still want you to bring those things that cause you to stumble and to sacrifice those? Absolutely. Should you still sacrifice things to love God? Yes. I think there are expectations when it comes to love. But as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give away all that I have to the poor, and if I give, my, give up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. God is after your heart today. Much more than your attendance in church. Much more than, oh, I give that 10%. Much more than the fill in the blank. He's after your heart. He wants that mercy to get into your heart. Mercy matters, and here is the big idea for, for today. God's mercy, it cannot be earned, and it cannot be lost. It Honestly, it doesn't matter what theological camp you're in. I know we're in Louisville, so there's a certain population that believes one thing about what I just said. I'm not talking about that, okay? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you are blessed. God's mercy, though, it cannot be earned, and it cannot be lost. It is always offered. It's always given to you. God's mercy is offered to you through Jesus in all places, in all situations, at all times. God's mercy simply exists for your benefit, and you have access to it without even working for it. How crazy is that? Isn't that amazing? And once you have it, it's not like your phone or your keys, because you can't lose it. You just have it. By the way, this mercy is for everybody. It's, it's offered to everybody. So I'll ask, if you are a Christian with us today, does God see you or define you by your mistakes? No. He sees you through mercy, through Jesus. Now, just as important, does God define you or see you for all of your good works and deeds? Is that how he defines you? No. He sees you through his mercy, and that mercy has a name, and his name is Jesus. Amen, church? Mercy has a name. There's, there's nothing you could do right to earn more of that mercy. It is just given to you. It is simply offered to you. And Christians, as you interact with maybe some non-believers or unbelievers, you know at times, or maybe you've thought this way too, I gotta clean myself up before I come to God, before I come to church. No, no you don't. Wear a little Nas X shirt and get in here with your hands in your pockets. Or you can raise your hands in worship. You can come in here with minty fresh breath or alcohol in your breath because you're having a hard time. We don't care. You belong here. We want you in church. We want you to be with us. It doesn't matter. We just want to show you that God is merciful and is a God of second and third and fourth and fifth and infinite chances. That is mercy. So 
I don't know what God you grew up with. I don't know what God has been preached to you. But that is the God that we see and know. And just so you know, when it comes to good deeds, when it comes to mistakes, there are no cosmic sized scales that weigh your good deeds and your bad deeds. Those don't exist. That's karma. And karma, it's a popular cultural belief, but it's not a biblical one. Your faith in God depends on him and his what? His mercy. Y'all are picking it up. You get it. It's all about his mercy, and his mercy is constant. And so if you are a Christian, if you say, I follow Christ, I'm all in, then you need to remember what God is like. He's merciful. That's what he is. He's so good. And if God is so full of mercy, then shouldn't mercy be the basis for how we see others? Shouldn't mercy be the way that we approach a tough situation, a tough relationship? For example, if one of my kids, and they would never do this, but if they mouth it off to their mom, and they, maybe they slammed the door, and maybe they, they yelled at me, do I love them less? Of course not. My love's not dependent on their performance and obedience. I will always love them, good or bad, through it all. Now, not to say certain actions don't come with certain consequences, but, but good parents don't love their kids more when they behave and, and less when they misbehave. There is a constant, unrelenting mercy we extend to those that we love, or at least we should. This love, this love that God loves you with, it is a constant, never-ending, unbreaking, always and forever sort of love. Mercy matters because it reveals what we really think about God and specifically how you relate to God. Because the way you believe God treats you is how you will treat others. So if you believe God is keeping track of all your mistakes and he's ready to smite you back into submission, guess how you're going to treat other people? But if you recognize that God is good, he's merciful, he is quick to forgive. If that's your understanding of God, then that should affect your relationships likewise. I believe if you don't have a proper understanding of God, then that will affect and it will infect your horizontal relationships with one another. We all have relationships with people, good or bad, no matter what. So do we have some room to grow in our mercy today? I know I do. I do. But, but, but do you have some room for, for mercy today? And so as, as I prepared for this weekend, I realized that the only healthy, unmerciful relationship that I have, I think there is one unmerciful relationship you can have, and it actually be somewhat healthy. And that is with the weights at the gym. Because they don't care, they don't discriminate, okay? They're unmerciful, and that's fine with me. Otherwise, I simply believe every other relationship we have, we have should be about mercy. It should be about mercy. So just really quick, I think there are three areas of life that if, I think if you injected mercy into it in these three areas of life, I think we would see a church completely change. I think we'd see a community on fire for Christ. I think it would change the world if we would take hold on this beatitude of mercy. That we wouldn't see mercy as just like, well, I want to I I be merciful in this situation. But instead we said, I want to have a merciful heart. Can I just have a merciful heart? Heart. I think that's a bold prayer. And so as, as we walk through kind of these three areas, maybe you fit all three of them. Maybe you only fit two of them. Maybe you fit one of them. It's still huge. So go with me for a moment. Three areas. There's mercy in marriage, okay? Because an unmerciful marriage, I mean, of course, it's difficult. It's selfish. It's toxic. Now, listen, let's be real, though, okay? No, marriage is not a walk in the park, but marriage also is not Jurassic Park, okay? <laughs> It's, it's not perfect, and it, it shouldn't be awful, okay? But I think there's a healthy, merciful rhythm to be found in marriage. My wife and I, we are living examples of what Matthew 5, 7 represents. Not because we get it right every time, but because we get it wrong all the time. And, and, and this mercy just this moves us forward because Jesus says that you are blessed to be merciful. So if you have ever had a standoff with your spouse 
and you know it's going nowhere fast, but the kids are asleep and you're ready to argue. I can go till midnight tonight, baby. I'm ready to fight. And then all of a sudden, in my case, my wife grabs my hand and she says, you know, the part where you said I did this or I said this and I wronged you. I repent. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? There's part of me that wants to say, this is so unfair. I was prepared to fight. I was ready to go. But what happens to that hardest thing? Mercy. It just melts that harshness away. It really, it, it melts those, those wrong, sinful motives. They, they, they melt away. And so if you have ever been married or are married. Listen, I'm no licensed counselor or anything like that. And it's not like, hey, here's the one thing to solve all marriage problems or anything. I'm not saying that. But I think it's biblical to take a deep breath. I think it's biblical to take a deep breath, for one. Let's just stop right there. Can we all just take a deep breath? It's Christmas. Family expectations, friends' expectations. But to take a deep breath, to give grace, and to show some mercy. Intentional mercy, I think, can change everything. And when we choose to take a step back, when our marriage gets hard, when we're miscommunicating, when we feel like we're going in a direction that we don't like, if we can take a step back and apply some mercy, I, I think things change. Now, now, kind of with that, as you could probably anticipate, I think there's a great deal of mercy in parenting as well. That I'm just, I'm always eager to grow in. I'm always eager to, to hear your stories of, what went right, what went, what went mostly wrong, because, you know, that's just how it is sometimes. Um, but I want to share a little story. This isn't my story. I want to share a story that a pastor wrote about earlier this year that I had included in a previous sermon, but it didn't quite fit. And so this week, when I realized kind of where I, I was, I was like, oh, i got to find this. I tracked it down. I'll uh, just take a couple of minutes. I'm just going to read it as he wrote it, though, okay? Uh, uh, he wrote, Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I am sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. And after a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption. And we ended up welcoming this eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, and they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. So in the, in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong. This family, this, this new family, this family begins to plan their own trip to Disney. And slowly, as that day draws closer and closer, this, this eight-year-old, who is now a new family, she began acting out in ways the family had never seen her do before. And there is a month of constant disobedience and bad attitudes and mouthing off and so on happening. And the dad just isn't sure what to do. It was like a switch had flipped inside this little girl. A couple of days before our family was to head to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk her through her latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she said. You're not going to take me to Disney, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way to the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test before. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on Earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear into my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, yeah, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, by God's mercy, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? And she nodded, brown eyes wide and in a tear grin. Are you part of this family? And she nodded again. Then you're going with us, 
Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and wrong, but you're part of our family, and we're not leaving you behind. So they go. It's their, it's their first evening in their hotel room at Disney. And a very different child emerged that night. She was exhaustive, uh, exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times. But her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. And when bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, and I held her, and I asked her, so how was your first day at Disney World? And she closed her eyes, she snuggled her little stuffed unicorn, and after a few moments, opened her eyes and said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. Church, don't you know that's how God sees you? It's, it's not because you're so good and have it all together. It's because you're his. That's the message of mercy. Mercy isn't a favor you can achieve by doing good. It's the gift you receive by God's mercy. Mercy is God's goodness that comes looking for you when you have nothing but a middle finger to flip back at him in return. It is, it is a farmer paying a full day's wages to accrue a deadbeat day laborers with only a single hour punched on their time cards. It's a man marrying an abandoned woman and then refusing to leave her when she turns out to be a prostitute. Mercy is the insanity of a shepherd who puts 99 sheep at risk to rescue the single lamb that's too stupid to stay with the flock. It's the love of a father who hands over his finest rings and robes to a young man who squandered his inheritance on drunken benches with fair-weather friends. Mercy is a one-way love that calls you into the kingdom, not because you're good, but because God has chosen you and you're his. That's mercy. And now this God chases you to the ends of the earth to keep you as his child and nothing in heaven or in hell could stop him from doing that. And the most amazing part is that this isn't just something God the Father would do. It's something he did do. And his name is Jesus. God, the creator of the universe, came in pursuit of you. And so to me, as I look at the cross, I see a bridge. I see a bridge that God created to come and, 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 and rescue us. That's mercy, church. It is a beautiful thing. And, and I know for me at times, I, I need to take a step back and remember that. Whether it's in my marriage or in my parenting, or, or, or this third one is, is, is community. My, having mercy in community, in this. I think if we, if we really chose and leaned into mercy, I think it would, it would also it would change a lot of things around here. And honestly, when it comes to mercy in our community, I don't have enough time to talk about this. I think we could write a book, right? Because maybe there are times when you, you read into a situation or you read into an interaction and you have with someone and you start to read into it and you, and you begin to spiral. You need to take a deep breath. And ask yourself, what would mercy say right now? When we could get offended because something we didn't like was done, what would mercy do instead? When we could respond with, with impatience and arguing and quick temper, how would mercy respond in a loving community? Church, let's, let's, let's give a little grace and let's show some mercy with one another. Intentional mercy, I believe, could could change everything. Because this is my last my last thing. If mercy isn't for all of us, then mercy isn't for any of us. And so I don't know what maybe you're holding on to, but I think you could you could use some mercy today. I know I could use some mercy today. Could you use some mercy today, church? Could you use some mercy some mercy today? I want to invite our, our worship band back up right now as, as, as I wrap up and, and as we go into a time of, of really intentional ministry. Can we settle our hearts right now? Maybe close your eyes, maybe bow your head if you need to. And think of, if, you, if you're a Christian, 
Think of that great debt that you were forgiven of. Like what mercy you have experienced, what mercy you have, have embraced because of the goodness of God. You didn't earn that, it was given to you. Like, wow. And so we say, thank you, God. We say, thank you, God. Thank you for your great mercy. That you would give that to a sinner like me. It's amazing. It's beautiful. That is love. To accomplish it the way that you did. To sacrifice your own son. To reach me. to comprehend. But God, please don't let us forget. I don't want to, I don't want to go through the motions on Sunday. I don't, I don't want to just go through the motions on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and, and just suffer through the holidays. God, I want to, I want to see you move. I want to see you move in our church. I want to see you move in our community. I want to see you move in this neighborhood. We can have all the vision in the world. We can, we can desire to see lives change in the name of Christ. But God, I know you've got you to do some heart work inside of me first. So God, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. For your love. For your grace. But God, this should inspire something within it should inspire us to be merciful to others. It is a hard time of the year sometimes when in certain relationships, that's difficult. God, give us mercy so we can give mercy. God, help us, Father in heaven. As we go back into this time of worship, um, you can stand. You can remain seated. You can kneel, you can lay down. I just want us to, to worship a good God who's been so merciful to us and show us how we need to give this mercy to others. If you're in a situation today and you need, you need some mercy, you need some prayer, could we pray with you today? Church, this isn't about just coming and listening to something encouraging. This is about experiencing God. And a huge part of this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we don't just have people up here to pray over. We have people to bring the kingdom of God into your life, church, who needs some mercy today. Don't hesitate. Father, move us. Draw us closer to you in Jesus' mighty name. Powerful.